We will read James 5 and verse 16. James 5, verse 16. The Apostle James is writing concerning the tribulation time period. During this tribulation time period, he urges the saints to confess their faults one to another. Through confessing faults, there's a power behind that which is kind of unexplainable, but confession to public, and when the public hears it, it gives some kind of recognition, it gives some kind of firm belief where people will remember it and they can visibly or physically hear it and see it and experience it for themselves. If nothing has been confessed but kept inwardly, then nobody would be able to witness the power or experience the power. Confession is very important. Uh, Roman Catholics have infamously used this passage to talk about confessing sins to a priest. But the Bible, the Bible, does not say confess your sins. Yeah. I don't know which Bible you got, but if your Bible says confess your sins, you got a wrong Bible. Right. The Bible, King James, says confess your faults. Yes. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Healing comes through confession and confessing the fault. There is a joke that goes, I've told uh, many people this one, so uh, others have not heard of this joke, so I'll say it this way. There's a joke that goes that there was a revival meeting, the Holy Spirit was mightily moving, and then souls were getting saved. This brother already knows. <laughs> souls were getting saved. People were getting on the altar, getting right with God, and man, you can sense the Holy Spirit was in the whole place. So then one of the preachers, you know, he got together with the other preachers. I mean, all sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and everyone was under conviction. And that preacher said, you know, James 5, 16 says, confess your faults one to another. We need to do this. That way, we can, uh, the Holy Spirit can have more free reign upon the people. We're just holding back on each other. So the preachers got to get... So then that preacher encouraged the other preachers, we got to confess, we, uh, what's, what's your fault you need to confess? And then that preacher said, well, yeah, you know, I've been, I have to confess that I've been drinking. And then the preacher who uh, started the whole thing, who said, we got to confess our faults one to another, said, what, you've been drinking? I can't believe it, you've been drinking, oh my goodness, all right then. Then he went to the next preacher. All right, then. Confess your fault one to another. And then the other preacher said, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't tell it people this, but after church is over, I go out for a smoke. And then the preacher who told everyone to confess, he said, what? Smoking? I can't believe you've been smoking. Then he went to the other preacher, and they said, okay, well, confess your fault. What's your fault? And then the other preacher confessed, I just don't say this to people, but... You know, my, my, uh, my fault that I always give into is that I've always been angry and I lashed out at my family when I shouldn't have. And then the preacher who said, who encouraged everyone to confess their faults said, what? You, you, you lash out at your own family? How come you got anger issues? And then while the preacher said, well, now it's your turn. Confess your fault. And then that pastor uh, he said, well, my fault is gossiping. I'm going to go out and gossip. <laughs> uh, now, why do I start with this joke, all right? I start with this joke because uh, in this passage, I do want to confess faults, but not my own fault. I want to confess someone else's faults, actually. And I'm going to name people in the church. Now, some of you are like, Laughing and you're like, wait, what? Wait, what? I am going to confess someone else's fault today. And then we'll see who leave the church today. The first person I want to confess the fault is we're going to go to John 19. John 19. John chapter 19. I want to put the blame and fault on someone. But to be honest, it's going to be hard to do that. It's going to be impossible for me to uh, blame this particular person and say it is all his fault. 
because he has a very clean record. He never messed up one time. As a matter of fact, people tried to frame him on phony charges and they executed him with a criminal's death. And you cannot find fault with this person. We're going to look at John chapter 18, excuse me, John 18, and then verse 38. Pilate, he confessed in front of all the public. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. My friend, uh, there are times in my life that I would wonder and question why God would do these things. And when I look at the past 6,000 years of human history, in my own human mind, I would say, well, that don't make sense. I would do it this way if I were God. Uh, if you look at today's world, they always find faults with God today. They find something to critique and they do not believe that he exists at all. Even when Jesus died out of love for the whole world, the greatest act of love, people still find fault with that. They deny the blood of Jesus. They'll say that Jesus never died on the cross. Or they'll say he's just a good man who just died. That's it. They don't recognize the importance in his act of love on the cross. Or they will say, well, that's so violent. I don't know why you have to say that or show about that. They'll always find fault with Jesus Christ. Uh, my friend, and I'll be honest, is I have to find fault with Jesus Christ. You might say, well, how can you do that? Because don't you have more faults than Jesus Christ? True, you're absolutely right. If I, you were to compare me uh, with Jesus Christ, there's so many faults you can find in me. So many faults you can find in me, and you'll find my faults more easily than Jesus Christ. Uh, but my friend, if you're so good at finding faults in me, I wonder how much more the devil could find faults in me. He's very good at that. He probably has a whole record laid out to uh, list all my faults more than you can. More than you can. If I did any fault to anybody here, it would probably be one or a couple at the most. If I have 20, then you need to talk to me after church is over. <laughs> but I might have one or maybe most two, three. I hope no more than that you know, or none at all. But you might find fault with me here and there. But the devil, he can sure make a long list and find a lot of fault with me. Uh, but let me tell you something, my friend. Those faults that you accuse me with and those faults that the devil accused me with, I'm going to... Simply tell you that you will still find none in me. You might say, no, pastor, if, uh, I know your fault right here. I've observed this one, what you did that time and that day and what mistake that you did. And I can sure prove it and point it out to you. Well, my friend, that's true. You might point it out. But someone took that fault for me. The man who had no fault is Jesus Christ. And he took my fault upon himself. So if you were to accuse me of any mistake that I've done... My friend, it's not my fault. It's Christ's fault. The blame goes to him. The fault all goes to Jesus Christ. Why can't I burn in hell even though I messed up in a godless sinful life? You're right, I deserved hell. But you know what? That blame went on Jesus Christ. You know, it's his fault that I am not going to burn in hell today. It's all God's fault that I cannot lose my salvation. Now, Roman Catholics, Muslims get mad at us Baptists, and they'll get mad at us Bible believers. You think that you can still be saved no matter what sin you want to do, and they just want to blame you. My friend, that's not my fault. Blame it on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he shed his precious blood and washed away all the faults that I had in my life. You're just jealous because you're still guilty of your fault, and I stand innocent, holy, and righteous. Blameless in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. It's all God's fault. He paid my price. He took the blame. The man who had no fault said, I'll take your fault. Put every single fault upon me. When I live in fault and in guilt in my life today, and I think so many times I deserve hell, I think so many times about, oh man, shouldn't I lose 
my salvation. I think so many times how unworthy that I am to even pastor a church or bring any single glory to his name. My friend, uh, all the fault goes on Jesus Christ. It's all his fault because he paid the price. He paid the sin debt. And he took all the fault upon himself. My friend, eternal security is Jesus Christ's fault. My friend, the assurance of salvation is all Jesus Christ's fault. My friend, salvation uh, without any works involved is all Jesus Christ's fault. Lordship salvation being heresy is all Jesus Christ's fault. My friend, once saved, all way saved is all of Jesus Christ's fault. My friend, to have a good night's sleep without worrying about the afterlife is all of Jesus Amen. Christ's Praise fault. My friend, Amen. my place having a mansion up in heaven is all of Come Jesus on. Christ's fault. My name written in the Lamb's book of life is all of Jesus Christ's fault. My friend, no matter how many times I mess up in my sin and the blood of Jesus Christ has washed it all away is all of Jesus Christ's fault. The gospel of faith is all of Jesus Christ's fault. Faith, no works, is all of Jesus Christ's fault. Reincarnation is a lie is all of Jesus Christ's fault. Sacraments being a lie is all of Jesus Christ's fault. Islam being a false religion is all of Jesus Christ's fault. Buddhism is a false religion is all of Jesus Christ's fault. Mormonism is a lie is all of Jesus Christ's fault. Seventh-day Adventism being a lie is all of Jesus Christ's fault. It's all of Christ's fault. It's the cross. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that has all the fault, all the blame, all the sin. You put it all on it because it can bear it. And I can't. I can't. It's all Christ's fault that I'm saved, that I'm going to heaven. I cannot lose my salvation. I have a peace that cannot be explained. And I know that in eternity that I will have a, that I can smile before I die. Right. It's all his fault. Put the blame on him. They all get mad at us. But, you know, you can't put the anger on us. You can't blame us. He took it. Yeah. He took it. You can't do that. I also want uh, you to turn to... 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I would like to confess, confess somebody else's fault today. I would like to put the blame upon the preachers. It's all their fault. The world hates preachers. They always want to find some scandal. Uh, members always find criticism against pastors nowadays. It's so easy to critique now a preacher more than a politician nowadays. And you know what? I'm going to have to uh, join their side where I'm going to have to blame the preachers as well. It's all their fault. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But, but we, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Notice right here that the lost world, Jews and Greeks, they put the criticism, they see fault within the preaching. And they see so much fault and they walk out and get mad and they get offended. They don't like the preaching where it kicks against their sin. It kicks against wrong doctrine. And they put all the blame on the preacher. My friend, I have to blame the preachers today. I have to blame the preachers because a long time ago my father hated preachers. And then he made fun of Christianity. He thought all preachers were hypocrites. 
And there was no way on heaven and earth that he will ever become a saved Christian, let alone a pastor. But the Lord changed his heart one day. And then he received the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. God gave him a new heart and that anger and that wrath and that hatred all of a sudden turned to love and admiration. He had a burden for souls and the people. And that man who had the money, who had the riches, where I could have lived a rich, uh, I could have lived as a rich son, a rich life up at the northeast area of the United States and New England. But my friend, I have to blame. I have to put the blame on the preachers today because it was a preacher that showed the gospel to my father. It was a preacher that gave him a burden to become a pastor himself. It is the preacher that made him leave his riches so that I lose the riches. It is the preacher's fault that made him plant a church and made me become a pastor's son. It is a preacher's fault that convicted my heart in summer camp to accept the call to preach. It is a preacher's fault for three years in the armpit of Florida that made me believe in that book, that made me want to preach that book, that made me want to stand for that book, that made me want to die for this book, that made me want to defend this book, that made me want to kick anybody that wanted to kick this book. It is all those preachers' fault. It is the preacher's fault during the blowout meeting that made me get right with God and clean up my sin. It is the preacher's fault that made me have a burden for more lost souls and empty the track rack. It is the preacher's fault that made me finally quit the sin that I was struggling and addicted to and I said, I hate this, I want to stop this cycle. It is the preacher's fault that made me dress this way to come to church and the world mocked and laughed at me. It is the preacher's fault that made the world make fun of me when I mentioned Jesus' name. It is the preacher's fault. Preacher's fault, preacher's fault. I joined this lost world in blaming all those preachers. Lock them up, persecute them. But guess what? They will still annoy you. They still preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, blame the preachers. Blame the preaching of the cross. It went on for 2,000 years of history. You can kill them. You can torture them. You can lock them up. You can put restrictions and lock them and shut down your church. But the preaching continues on. Blame the preachers. Blame the preacher. Is that preacher's fault that made you get stuck into this church? What are y'all doing here? What y'all doing here? Blame the preaching, man. Preaching changed your heart. Preaching made you convicted. Preaching made you change things in your life. It's a preacher's fault. Those preachers create even more preachers. Blame them. What a plague. What a disease. What a virus that cannot be stopped. Blame the preaching of the cross. Amen, brother. Come on. It is that preacher, that preaching. Oh, and we have to add four more weekend revivals and a blowout and a summer camp. Oh, the preaching, man. Who would get who would skip out Sunday football to hear preaching? What insane person? What weirdo? would skip Sunday football for preaching. It's the preacher's fault. It's those preacher's fault. What would make this preacher, in spite of hardship, in spite of trial, during Sundays where he does not even want to preach, yet preach the message. It's those preacher's fault yesterday Oh, those preachers, when they preach just a 10-minute message from that book. I have to confess the fault of someone else. I blame Jared Kwong for the preaching. I blame Robert Garcia for the preaching. I blame Daniel Price for the preaching. I blame Brother Canute. I blame Brother Glenn. And I blame Pastor Joshua Stevenson from Bible Believers Baptist Church in El Cajon. That's right. I'm going to call out names. Give you specifics. I'm going to call out those pastors because that's my job. I blame these people and these preachers for making me preach to you today. When that fire dies out and I don't want to preach, it's those preachers' fault. It's those preachers' fault when you came in in a grouchy mood Sunday and you thought that nothing could move your heart. That preaching changed your heart. Yeah, yeah. yeah glory. You wonder why we come here? You wonder why we come here? What power, what thing has that touch? 
That miraculous touch where you can come in grumpy, grouchy, miserable, bitter, and you come to church and all of a sudden your heart transformed and turned into a total 180. What touch of God? What power of the Holy Spirit? What anointing? What words that are not the wisdom of the world, but the power of the Holy Spirit? Amen. Amen. Verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The world looks at this as foolishness. They'll mock and laugh, and they don't get it. But to you people, for some weird reason, it clicks. Some weird reason with you people, it connects. Some weird reason with you people, it's like, I need to hear that. It's the preaching. Blame the preaching. Blame the preaching with how you live today. Blame the preacher where the old you back then, the way you lived, the way you had plans for your job, your school, your living, your relationship, your goals. Do you remember the old you a couple of years ago? What made you change? What made you change direction? Was there some preacher? Was there some preaching that was given to you that made you change your mind? That made you change your plans? That made you reconsider your decisions? That made you, hey, I'm not going to follow my own way of doing things. It's that preacher's fault that changed your life today. My friend, the old you, if you go back five years ago, you're not the same as I old you now. And you can blame it all on the preacher. It's that preacher's fault. Jared could have been a billionaire by now if he just stayed with poker. Could have been a billionaire by now. Blame the preacher. Blame the preaching of the cross. Robert Garcia could have made 10 more uh, rap albums. It's that preacher's fault. Blame the preacher. We would have never met the Randalls and they wouldn't annoy us in church today if it weren't for preacher number one and preacher number two in their lives. Blame the preachers. Now we're stuck with them for life till the rapture maybe. Blame the preachers. It's all the preacher's fault. The preacher who had a burden to start a church in a wicked area, to come across your life, and what are the odds of you meeting? The preacher who prepared that sermon, sweated and surrendered to God, and had no idea about the struggle of anyone in that room that day that just met up like a T. It's all that preacher's fault, the preaching's fault. Lock up the preachers, blame the preachers. It's all their fault. Man, it's all their fault that I, now that I made a crazy decision when I could have made other decisions in my life today, relationships I could have made in my life today, the decisions that I can make in my life today, it's because of those preachers. They made me what I am today. It's all their fault now that I'm a pastor in a liberal Bay Area. It's all their fault that I can lead hundreds if not thousands to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all their fault that made me preach and stand for the King James Bible. It's all their fault that made me teach dispensational truth. It's all their fault that I went to the prisoners around the world and tried to show them from darkness into light. It's all those preachers fault that made me reach out to you and grab your hand and try to get you into the house of God and serve him and your life gets changed. It's all those preachers fault. Blame it on the preachers. Thank you, preachers. Blame it on the preachers. Thank you. Let's look at Philippians 1. Philippians chapter 1. I would like to confess somebody else's faults today. Yeah. Let's go. I would like to confess the faults of my enemies. Uh -oh. I would like to confess the faults of my enemies. Look at Philippians chapter 1. And then we'll look at verse 12. For I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. 
Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. rejoice. Paul mentions right here that even though his enemies would preach something and the people would see those enemies as, oh, you're the good guys. You're the ones who hold the truth of God, the truth of Jesus Christ. Paul sees that as, no, it benefits on my side. It still benefits on my side. It makes me better. The ministry, the gospel that I preached about Jesus Christ has spread out even further because of my enemies. It's better than the enemies not saying anything at all. If they didn't say anything at all, the news of Jesus Christ would not spread out even more. He needed more numbers. So he thanks his enemies for spreading out his ministry further. My friend... Uh, Enemies out there, they just mention about me online and then they'll criticize yours truly and my ministry. And does that annoy you? Oh, sure, it'll annoy me. Does it uh, bug you? Sure, it'll bug me. Of course. Sure, uh, don't you wish that they didn't put that out? Sure, that at times that I do. But you know what? Uh, if they didn't do those things, some of you wouldn't have discovered what my name was. Some of you wouldn't have found out the name of our church. Some of you would not be here today. How many people have I seen who found our online ministry or even our church or a Bible-believing church because the enemy of the Lord who thought that they were doing God a service was criticizing our work and our ministry. But in the end, what they did was, who is this? Bible believer. Who is, what is King James only is What is dispensationalism? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> this seems to make sense. Yeah. Oh, I want to drop by that church. Yeah. Why did subscribers all of a sudden go up? And I would go, it was a slow day. Why did it go up? <laughs> oh, I had five different channels out there who mentioned my name and criticized me. <laughs> wow, this is great. Thank you very much. <laughs> my friend, I blame my enemies for who I am today. You know, I would not be who I am today. I had no idea about internet. I had no idea about internet. But because of the culture over here being an internet world, I heard about so many enemies from people who attended my church and what a heresy was spreading. When I heard about that, what, ha what did I do? You know what? They're spreading heresy. I'm going to get on there and spread Bible-believing truth like no other. And I, it made me go online, and who would have thought where the Lord would carry us today? You know where you get annoying Gene Kim today? Who ha who's on YouTube with you and pops up the video next to yours and yours next to mine, and we're buddies, buddies for life? It's because of you. When my enemy says Gene Kim is a devil, I say thank you. When my enemy say that Gene Kim is a heretic and post that video for all the world to see, I say thank you. When people try to find a crazy video from me and try to publicize me online, I say thank you. Because of that, the work and the name of this ministry has spread out even further. Thank you out there, all of you. I had some members in my church because they saw your video, not mine. Thank you very much. Yeah. Why? Because you had to mention my name. You had to mention this ministry. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the Calvinists out there. Thank you to all the post trippers out there. Thank you to all the black Hebrew Israelites out there. Thank you to all the anti-dispensationalists out there. Thank you to all the atheists out there. Thank you very much. The Lord has certainly used your work to bless ours, to increase it tenfold. Thank you very much. The Lord Jesus Christ has used our enemies, and I blame it all on them. Now, I, here I am, ministering in the Bay Area, now online with them, thanks to those enemies. I would have never have done it without all you guys. You know who you are. You know who you exactly are. 
thank you very much. If it weren't for you, I would never have entered the internet world and then spread Bible-believing truth. Thank you very much to all the enemies out there who have tried to persecute, who have tried to shut us down, who tried to put restriction, who want to close down this church. Why? It made this pastor here increase tenfold more in wisdom. It made me understand this community more. All I was was just a simple nobody, just a young guy, just wanted to pastor a simple church. The complexity of this liberal area, the godlessness of this wicked area has made me use my brain more on how can I plan a church? How can I preach better? How can I teach better? How can I defend Bible-believing truth better? More lies that they teach in liberal universities, it made me learn them and made me learn how to critique it effectively if they had never done that. Thank you so much, Berkeley. Thank you so much, San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you so much, Kamala Harris. Thank you so much, Joe Biden. Thank you very much for all the liberal things that you have done to attack Christianity. It made me even more strong. It made me study more. It made me put up a fight more because I wouldn't go aggressively forward for it if I had no enemies to target. If I had no enemies to motivate me. There is no motivation in a competition, in a battle, when you don't have an enemy. When you have an enemy that you want to beat and you want to see them lose, it motivates you to try even harder, harder to win the game. Thank you very much, enemies out there. You have made me what I am today. You made me keep wanting to improve my preaching. You made me keep wanting to improve my teaching. You made me even want to be stubborn and stick to this area. Didn't you know there were times in my life I wanted to quit? There were times in my life I wanted to quit and close down the church. And I had no enemies back then. And I had to keep pushing forward. Then when the Lord gave me enemies, and I was like, I want to quit, then I'm like, no. So-and-so out there is yeah. still going. Yeah. The enemy is waiting for me to fall. Yeah. I can't quit even if I want to. Because yeah. they're going to poke fun at me. They're going to criticize me. They're going to say, look at him. He fell away. Look at him. He gave up church. No, I ain't going to quit. No, I ain't going to put up with that. I'm going to keep pressing on. I'm going to be so stubborn. I'll die here if I have to. Amen, Wow, My goodness, man, the, the guy who wants to live in the Bay Area, the guy who wants to leave this wicked place. Now there's just so much wickedness, so much battles to fight that I just can't quit even if I want to. I got too many enemies out there. You're going to make me fight. You're going to make me stubborn. You're going to make me stay. You're going to make me want to help out and win souls and rescue yeah. more souls out Amen. there. Amen. The enemies, I have so much to blame. Because now they put me in a fight that I cannot leave now. They put me in a place of a point of no return. And I just have to keep swinging my sword even if my flesh yes. don't want to. Yes. Thank you very much to the enemies out there. You made me what I am today. Thank you. There's, Thank a, there's somebody else's fault that I have to confess and blame. Yeah, let's go. We're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. Preaching, Pastor. Jeremiah chapter 20. I must confess somebody else that I must blame. Jeremiah. Oh, he had a lot to blame in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 7. He had a lot to blame at this particular person. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 7. O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart, as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Jeremiah, he was going to quit the ministry. He's saying, Lord, it's all your fault, and I'm not going to mention your name anymore. It's just too much preaching your word. But when he quit, and he said, I'm not going to mention your name, he said, but 
for some weird reason, your word burns in my heart. That word stirs me up. And I just don't want to say it. I just don't want to preach it. But it just comes out of me. And I don't know why, but it comes out of me. And I must preach. Because that word of God burns me up so much. And I must speak out. There's another, I mean, Jeremiah knew that the word of the Lord, that it kept him going. It kept him going. That's why he had to keep preaching. He couldn't stop. So my friend, I must blame the King James Bible. It's all the King James Bible's fault. Because of that book, it made me literally believe every word what that book says. Because of that King James Bible, it made me teach doctrines that I thought that I would never teach before. It's because of that book it made me believe in dispensationalism. It's because of the King James Bible it made me preach against sin harder than I ever could. It's because of that King James Bible it oh. brainwashed me. It changed my conviction and my oh, belief God. of what was comfortable in my flesh and gave it all up because of that King James Bible. Amen. It's all that King James Bible fault that I can't read any other book out there except that King That's James right. Bible. It's because of that book that I put my face in that book and not on Facebook. It's all the King James Bible's fault. The King James Bible 1611, the authorized version, that King's English, it retains every pure word of God and it stirs in my heart like a burning fire. It's that King James Bible's fault that made me believe in Stuff that I thought was crazy. I mean, who would have thought? I just had the, every, a lot of you had the view of the world around you. Your own morals. Yeah. Your own beliefs. Your own way of doing things. Your own counselors. What made you, what made you change your belief? It's when the preacher said, don't believe me, look at your book. Look at what that book says. Look at what that Bible says. It's this Bible's fault that made you change your belief. And everything that you used to hold dear and comfortable to your flesh. Blame the King James Bible. That's why the preaching is so hard. That's why the preaching is powerful. That's why the preaching cuts to the heart. It's because of that word of God. And all you say is, thus saith the Lord. And then the heart and the ears and the mind all of a sudden stand still and pay attention at the power and weight and the authority of that word. Amen. It's that word of God. It's that King James Bible's fault. There's someone else that I want to blame today. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians. Yeah, go. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians, please, 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. There's someone else that I want to blame today. I have a whole bunch of people here that I need to blame. First Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible says now in verse 1, verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaketh, speaking by the Spirit of God. Calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are di diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one in the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now it is the Holy Spirit's job where if you are saved, then the Holy Spirit's in you. Amen. And it is going to be his job to make sure that you have a gift and a talent that comes out. Amen. That can be used for his glory. Amen. Let's say verse 15. 
if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Notice right here that at verse 21, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. You know, if one member in the body of Christ thinks that, you know, that's, I'm all that's needed. I got my own life. I got my own preferences, my own way of doing things. I'm all right as I am. But then later on, that member in the body of Christ realizes, oh man, there are some weaknesses that I have, yes. some holes that I have. Yes. And as that member goes through life, they just need some help. Yes. They just need some encouragement. Yes. And then it turned out that particular member in the body of Christ thought that I'm okay by myself. Yes. I have my own decisions, my own plans, my own right. way of living. But it turned out to be dissatisfaction. Ah. It turned out to be I need help. It yes. turned out to be I can't go on. Yes. And then it turned out some other member in the body of Christ that you thought you didn't have need, all of a sudden encouraged. All of a sudden had a gift. All of a sudden had a testimony. All of a sudden contributed something to the church and you're like, wow. And when you saw that person, you're like, you know what? That person did something for the church. That person gave glory to God. Amen. I think I can do that too. Amen. You meet one of the most unconfident people in the universe and that is Gene Kim. One of the people who are the most disabled, the most uh, incompetent preacher and teacher. And that is Gene Kim. If people knew me at my beginnings, I was shy. I was reserved. I couldn't accomplish a single thing. My parents were even worried for me. And when I was born, they wondered if I was a little slow. Now you're saying I'm too fast. What made me change? Uh, it's because of when I saw a brother so-and-so out there who went through the same mistakes in preaching like I did. And when I saw that, I was like, you know what? Preachers can make mistakes too. I think I'll just keep going on. It's that brother's fault. I see some brother or sister in Christ giving a special in the church. And when I see that, I go, you know, maybe I could do something too. And, incur and give a blessing to someone Amen. in the church. Amen. I see some brother or sister in Christ going through a weakness or struggle in life. And I realize, wait, they're going through the same thing I did too. And yet they're serving God. I think I can do it too. Amen. It's that brother or sister's fault. When you go to a summer camp, it's something that's not deliberately done, but how the Holy Spirit moves and then when you hear somebody else's testimony at summer camp, what God saved them from, what God delivered them through, what kind of trials that God has answered for them, and how, how their background is so similar to your case, and yet they give the glory to God. When you hear that, my friend, you go, oh man, you know what? If brother and sister so-and-so can do it, I can do it too. If they're not going to quit out in church, and I'm going to and keep going to church. I'm going to do that too. Why is it that some people here, their life changed after summer camp? Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's so-and-so's fault, those people's oh. fault, where they all united one in heart and saw their gift, their heart, their desire, their zeal, and their shout for the Lord, and it got you so stirred up, and you're like, you know what, I want to join them too! Amen. Blame, blame that brother and sister in Christ, what they come contributed to the church what made you love singing what made you love singing man blame the song leader when he just keeps giving his little uh, little sermonettes on the pulpit and tells you about the songwriter picks a song that you're like oh man that song gets to me blame the song leader blame the pianist for playing the keys so well and it just stirs you up with the music and you want to give the glory to god blame the pianist Blame the person who's shouting behind you saying, Glory to God! And just makes you want to go, Glory to God! Blame the shouter behind you. Blame the so-and-so next to you who's singing with such sweet music and melody and accompanies the music and it makes you go, Man, I'm in heaven. Makes you want to sing too! Blame! Blame! Blame those church members out there. 
Amen. Blame those eight preachers who gets up besides the pastor and they only speak out 10 to 15 minutes and it makes you want to charge hell with a squirt gun. Blame those eight preachers, man. Blame their gifts. Blame their talents. Blame those soul winners who go out. Blame those people who pass out tracks and say, I passed out a hundred tracks. I was able to lead a soul today. And it just makes you want to puke when you hear a soul saved, a soul saved, a soul saved. Blame those soul winners that make you want to pick up a track. Yeah. And you had no courage to even leave one little track. Ooh. And then you hear a bunch of brothers and sisters saying, I was able to get out. Yeah. Just one yeah. track. Yeah. Yeah. And a gas station yeah. pump and it makes you go, you know, I think I can do that too. Yeah, glory. That temptation's open. That forbidden fruit is right there every time you walk in. And it makes you want to go. The line was too long for lunch. Maybe I'll. track rack. Blame the people. Blame the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the testimonies of the people, the singing talents, the preaching talents, the music talents, and just being to fellowship with you. Blame all those stinking people. This preacher cannot quit. This preacher cannot quit when someone's preaching for me, when someone has the mood to preach that day, when I have no mood to preach that day. When somebody has the mood to shout that day, and I have no mood to shout that day. When that person has the mood to show love and encourage someone that I have no mood to encourage and love someone. Oh, blame brother so-and-so. Blame sister so-and-so. So you're tired of that. Makes me want to keep committing as a pastor and do my job. Makes me want to keep street preaching. Yeah. Makes me want to soul win. Makes me want to read that book and pray. Yeah. Makes me want to keep preaching the word of God and to teach. Preach. It's because of all those stinking hungry people that says, thank you so much for that Bible study. Ooh. And I go, oh, now I have to teach the next Sunday. Why did it have to be that good? Praise and God. I'm like, man, that's a messed up sermon. Praise the Lord. And then sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so said, that was a sermon. Yes. That touched Thank my heart. Yeah. The Lord you. changed my life. Yeah. Why did they have to say that? Now I have to keep preaching the word of yeah. God. Thanks to all you people. I confess your fault. You're all to blame. Keep preaching. Keep preaching. How can I have a good night's sleep at night now when I think about quitting and I say I don't want to preach and teach and then so-and-so's mind pops up, pops up in my mind and they say, man, that preaching was a blessing. That teaching was a blessing. And they say, thank you for being there for us. And I go, why? Why? How can... What makes you keep coming to this church, huh? What makes you preach and teach? What makes you soul win? Blame that brother and sister in Christ sitting next to you. Just blame it all on them. We got to confess each other's faults today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's look at... 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Don't you just want to not come to church on a particular Sunday? Don't you just want to stay a little longer in bed? I mean, you got work at Monday. You're going to be tired. What y'all doing here? I mean, why are you still eating lunch with us? Don't you just want to go home? Yeah. It's... Man, aren't you sick and tired of Sister Sheila saying, I'm praying for you. And it makes you go, oh. Where pastor says, are you okay? And you go, oh. Where Wednesday night prayer meeting, hey, we're all praying for you. We're all praying for you. And you just want to say, shut up. I don't want to come back to this church. What are you doing to me? Blame it all on them. Man, don't you just hate the love in this room? They're just, they just hug you, they just say hi to you, they talk to you, and then they sh give you the love that the world cannot give to you. And then it, you just go, oh. That is so amazing. And then you go, man, why did you do that? 
Just why? Why did you do that to me? Now I have to come back to church because of you. I blame the charity and the love of the brethren. I blame their encouragement and their desire to care. I blame it all on them. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll look at verse 7. Last thing I want to blame. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amen. Did you notice it's Satan? That attacked the Apostle Paul with the particular trial and suffering. But then Paul gave the credit to the Lord at verse 9. God said, my grace is more than enough for you. Let's keep it there. And Paul, he attributed it. He didn't blame the devil. He gave that credit to the Lord. The easiest thing a lot of people do is blame God for whatever trial or suffering they go through in life. And that's why a lot of people in this wicked world cannot, uh, do not understand that in the Christian walk. But what they fail to understand is this. You cannot blame God for the sufferings in this world. It is actually because of our sin. Right. Yeah. Then why would God take responsibility right here? Why would God put his hand behind the suffering right here? You're right. This is where his fault is. His fault is he didn't leave you alone with that suffering. It's all his fault that he didn't leave you alone with the suffering. You and I deserve to go through tears at night with our pain without crying out to God even one time. We deserve that. We deserve it where God doesn't hear our prayer once. Yeah, we deserve it. When we need his help on something. You and I are worth it. A famine, disease, starvation, war, yeah. crime, yep. bloodshed. Yep. You and I deserve all of that because of sin. Hell. Yep. And it's all God's fault that he said, I won't leave you alone. It's all his fault that he says, you, you can just put all that pressure on me, not on yourself. Thank you, Jesus. And claim Romans 8, 28. Yes, amen. And say, I'll take care of it. Yes, and when yes. you go through the pain, even of your own sin, even through the consequence of your own sin, you can simply let it go and say, even though I deserve this, God made a promise to me, Thank even you. in chastisement. Thank you, Jesus that he would do it for my betterment. You, and it makes you let go of yourself and put it all the fault and all the burden and all the pressure on God and let him work it out. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's all of God's fault, not that he gave us suffering. It's all of God's fault that he's willing to take our suffering Thank and you, use Lord. it for his glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, I think we have a lot to blame God for. I think we have people in this room that we need to confess the fault and blame at. I think that the King James Bible, we need to give a lot of blame to it. Even our enemies who made us who we are, that increased our kindness, our charity, our zeal, and our stance to fight. There's a lot to blame. Let's blame them all on this altar. Every head bowed and every eye shut.